Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is Alex Bond from the Eno Center, and thank you for joining us. Um, this webinar is originally started from our alumni webinar series, and we're happy to open this up to the broader Eno community to talk about labor relations, uh, particularly in the transit area, but our, our speaker today has some really broad experience. He can speak to other sectors and other modes as well. Uh, so very happy to uh, introduce Bill Scott. Uh, he'll be speaking today. He's the CEO and the founder of the firm Diversified Workforce Solutions. That's uh, his firm in, in Maryland and lets him uh, apply his expertise in HR, collective bargaining, and employee relations around the country. Uh, he's a really broad experience uh, in this area. He served as a director of employee relations or, and labor relations uh, in academia, government, uh, as, and in particular, the public transit industry. Uh, he served as the deputy general manager at WMATA. Uh, here in D.C. and a couple of other roles, including the chief civil rights officer, uh, and still is very active in transit, uh, is currently serving as the chief labor negotiator at MARTA in Atlanta, and also is handling all labor relations with Montgomery County, Maryland, including their transit system right on, uh, and all of their government services, including police, fire, and general government employees. Uh, so Mr. Scott's going to give us uh, his a lecture here on uh, employee relations and labor relations, and uh, then we'll open up to questions. There is a question tool here on your toolbar. If you go ahead and type in there, uh, we will uh, read those off at the end of the webinar. And just so everybody knows, we are recording this, and we'll post it up on the alumni portion of the you know webpage, and uh, that'll be available to anyone else who couldn't make it today. So, uh, Bill, would you like to start us off? Or take it yeah. away. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm here to just trying to share with you some of my experiences with relate with with respect to labor management relations and an overview of how I've seen things over the years and share some of the experiences with you. And then after that period of time, entertain your questions that you may have. So I'd like to move on first of all, and we'll entertain questions at the end. Uh, just to provide the overview, many of you are very seasoned, experienced executives and you've had some experience with labor relations some of them I may you may have had a lot of experience with labor relations but for those who haven't you know just to give a, a understanding the transit industry is one of the few industries that's heavily unionized and still today is a public sector union and so therefore there are some basically key principles that is very important uh, in dealing with labor unions inside the transit industry and I found these three keys to be very important to keep in mind. First of all, as executives and managers and supervisors of the bargaining unit, uh, it's important to understand your labor climate. That's number one. What climate am I in? Uh, do I have uh, some key indicators? Are Do I have a high number of grievances? Is the turnover rate high? Absenteeism high? What's the morale like? And so understanding your labor climate helps you to lay out a labor plan for your future in dealing with the labor unions. Second point I think is very important and key indicators, and, and that is ensuring that supervisors and managers have an understanding and knowledge of the collective bargaining agreement. And my experience has been over the years that we promote people into supervisory positions, but they don't have the background on the collective bargaining agreement, and they're dealing with bargaining unit employees, and that's the Bible between the two parties. That's the contract. So if you don't understand the contract, you will be somewhat intimidated when one party understands it and the other one doesn't. And that's what happens with respect to the union having trained their shop stewards on the contract. And we, as managers, and I'm including myself, that we don't always train our supervisors and managers on the collective bargaining contract. So that's very important to ensure that those things take place. And then the third point, the third key, I think, is understanding the importance of the collective bargaining process. I've been involved as a chief negotiator for, in collective bargaining for about 35 years. Uh, and as my experience has been that we don't adequately prepare, management doesn't adequately prepare for negotiations. Uh, the successful negotiations are those that prepare early because the data drives the negotiations process. So the more prepared you are, the better you will come out of the negotiation process. So it's important uh, to adequately prepare it's also very important in selecting the right management spokesperson and team. Too often I've seen where 
Um, the management representatives are someone maybe in operations and and not necessarily in labor. And as a consequence, because they know operations, uh, when the operations issues are satisfied, many of the other issues related related to collective bargaining are not addressed. So the contract is not really um, addressing the labor issues throughout the company. And as a consequence, you have still poor labor management relations because the issues have not been addressed. So it's important picking the right spokesperson and team. And it should be viewed as important to the process of running your organization as it is to the budget process because in most cases, uh, 60 to 70 percent of your budget is tied to labor costs. And if you don't adequately prepare with respect to negotiations, it's very costly. And there been studies that have been done that indicate that uh, work rules uh, add about 25 percent to your cost. So if you, in fact, don't pay attention to work rules. A lot of times in negotiations, management will pay attention to the bottom line of budget with respect to wages and benefits and ignore the work rules. Well, the work rules can add as much cost as a 2 or 3% increase in wages because they will tie you up with having to check with the union on various issues that you can't normally just provide uh, an answer to. And that happens with respect to, you know, the overall relationship itself. The union's view the collective bargaining process as the Super Bowl, and we don't view it, and in most cases, management doesn't view it in that same light. So uh, in cases where negotiations are scheduled to start, a lot of times management's preparation doesn't start to right at the time when negotiations are underway, and that's, that's a fatal flaw in moving forward, in my opinion. And <clears throat> so then that moves us into some of the challenges of labor relations. What are some of the global challenges that we face as managers and supervisors uh, in the transit industry. And there are global issues that affect us and challenges that affect the labor management relationship. And they are wide ranging, as you can see, some of them I have identified challenges are caused by a wide ranging of factors, labor disputes within the organization, within labor itself, management and union leadership turnover. That's a big one because you develop a relationship with the union leadership and then all of a sudden they're voted out of office because the membership views them as too cozy with management and you have to start the development of that relationship all over again and that can set you back for you know in terms of uh, your overall labor management relationship and then as you all know as manager and supervisor fiscal crisis is developed a lot of times the budget issues relate to uh, layoffs and, and um, reductions in forces that then causes problems in the workforce and then in some cases where you have lack of taxpayer support, technology advances and politics, politicians get involved and they're concerned about how much you're paying the, uh, the bargaining unit members and they have an uh, influence on that. And so those things are all challenges that we face in the labor management relationship. On the local level, you're dealing with a lot of other issues related to absenteeism, safety concerns, and availability of employees, late reports and the like. So those challenges are there on a global basis as well as on a local basis. So how do you address them? And the only way that you really can address them, in my view, is to lay a proper labor management foundation. And how do you do that? Well, the three words that basically I've found to be most important in laying that foundation, that's trust, respect, and the third one, communications. And we can point to a number of um, issues I see right now in the labor field out there in terms of disputes between labor and management where it has gone to communications and the communications is broken down so therefore the trust is broken down and, and if you don't have the trust you really don't have a good relationship and you don't have respect for each other you don't as well so trust in labor circles is uh, very important and your word is your bond as managers and many of you know you give your word on a particular subject to the union, you try and keep it. If you made a mistake, you go back and you indicate to them that a mistake was made and that you're now correcting it, but this is the um, position that you have and that you are going to um, be true to your, your word. If you gave them the word, make sure you stay with that because trust has to be built. Without trust in the relationship, you really don't have a labor management relationship. Respect as well, even though there may be a difference in education and training, 
Uh, you still have to respect the fact that the bargaining unit members are represented by a union, and you have to have mutual respect in order to have a relationship, and <clears throat> that's very important. Uh, <clears throat> uh, if the union you doesn't demonstrate respect in return, uh, you need to remind them of the mutual respect if they want to get anything done. You don't have to take disrespect from the union for sure. As managers and supervisors, you don't have to have that and accept that, but you have to remind them that they want to get things done. It has to be done by mutual respect. And the third component that a lot of uh, transit properties I've seen uh, where we have fallen down is on the communications. There should be a communications plan in place where it's important as to how you communicate and when you communicate with uh, the union and the union leadership on the various issues that are important to both the parties. Too often I've seen where um, the policies are put out and the policies are put out and the bargaining union leadership is not aware of them and as a consequence a member will come to the union leader tell them about a policy or something that uh, they have not been aware of and that causes issues related to trust and it causes issues related to their relationship and the union leadership's egos are fragile as they are they get upset and then you gotta you know you have more issues related to uh, your overall labor management relationship so it's important to have a communications plan as part of your labor management relations uh, how and when you communicate with them on various issues should be laid out somewhere and take a few moments to lay it out as to how you will be communicating with the with the uh, union on on the various issues affecting the bargaining unit so trust respect and communications are I think the three keys to a good labor management relationship and I would suggest that you know the parties have that in place and then <clears throat> these are just follow-up items which deals with again understanding of the collective bar process your CBA is the foundation of your relationship with the union and identifies the rights and responsibilities of both parties and one of the things that's also a concern is the frequency of management turnover you know we promote people and we move them on very quickly and many of the managers are not as familiar with the CBA as the shop stewards, and that puts them at a disadvantage. So you want them to be on equal footing, and the only way they can do that is to be and as knowledgeable as the union uh, on the contract. And I know that, that with everything else that you have to do, it's difficult because of the service you have to put out on the street and managing the workforce itself. But it behooves you to put some time into having that uh, as an uh, indicator in your training that uh, after each bargaining cycle that there is training to be done on the new uh, contract. I can <clears throat> say to you that you can always tell uh, in the collective bargaining process the management rights by the thickness of the labor agreement. If I walk into a facility and I see a very thick labor agreement, I know that they have negotiated away a lot of management rights because prior to negotiating them away, you have all the rights in the world until you do negotiate them away. And so every contract, the union may ask for 2 or 3%, but they're chipping away at those management rights that you have. And at each time, the contract grows thicker and thicker. And if you're not focused on that, you will end up with a very thick contract where you can't even go to the restroom without checking with the union. So it's important to uh, manage that process. And ensure that your supervisors and managers are properly trained uh, and and the, on the issues that related to the CBA, as I said in the last part of that, not knowing is very costly. Some of the dues, I would suggest these over the years, ensure, again, I'm just going back to the importance of the CBA training, knowledge of your rights under the CBA. I've gone in to conduct training, management training, management rights training, and many of the managers didn't know they had the rights that they have under the collective bargaining agreement the right to direct the workforce and all the areas that go under that particular right um, many of them did not uh, were not aware that they had those rights and so they're promoted to supervisory positions they know what they have to do in terms of supervising the employees but they don't know what rights they have in terms of the collective bargaining process Labor management committees are important uh, on issues that um, before they blow up into major problems at your transit industry, I found them to be very useful. I have a cautionary note on the don'ts, and I'll talk to you in a moment about that. But they're very, they're very um, 
uh, instrumental in areas related to skill training, testing, apprenticeships, preventable accidents, workplace security. You have those joint committees, they can really help you in those areas. And there's a cautionary note that I would talk to you about, but I found labor management committees are important provided they meet on a regular basis as to the schedule that you keep for them. So what happens, We I've seen a lot of contracts that have labor management committees and they don't meet. Well, that's a problem because the union, when you get to negotiations and you want to make a change, the union say, well, you know, we, we had labor management committees, but you guys never brought the issue up or you never uh, had any meetings. So, you know, they're going to be against the ideas that you raise at the bargaining table. The uh, labor management committees allow you to have like a release valve during the time period of negotiations. So if you have a three-year contract, if you can discuss these issues in between the three years, by the time you get to the uh, collective bargaining process, it's not a new idea that you're presenting to the union as to what changes you want to make. Unions don't do well with uh, last-minute ideas at the bargaining table. So, again, the third thing, as I said, fourth thing is to develop this communications plan. That's very important. I'd like to just keep coming back to that because that's so important. I can see some of the troubles today with some of the uh, transit industries, uh, transit properties that I see having labor troubles right now. I'm not going to point them out, but a lot of them goes to the fact that there was no communications between the two parties that kept the uh, uh, trust going. So keep your word. Your bond is your word, and it's important to build trust in that relationship. The don'ts. One of the things I raised to you earlier was just on the issue of the Labor Management Committee. This is very important. A lot of committees have been formed, but don't give away management rights in providing labor management committees with decision-making authority. Decision-making authority is rest with management. It doesn't rest with the bargaining unit. And we'll talk about the rights that the bargaining unit has, and the union has, and you have later on. But it's important to note that decision-making authority must rest with management. So you want to ensure that when you have labor management committees, that they have recommendation authority only. They recommend it to the party. They recommend it to the management uh, as to what changes they would like to see, but they don't have the decision-making authority to make those changes. That's important. Otherwise, you're going to end up in a malaise with you can't move because the union is not agreeing to something that uh, you want to move on, but you put it in a committee, and now the committee is stuck. And so it's important not to uh, uh, have uh, decision-making authority in a committee context. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, I can't emphasize that enough because I've seen it so many times. And, um, you know, and it uh, is a real problem for management because they put that into a committee. Uh, like, for example, one I saw where the committee, and I have IE, for example, a committee to review and modify job duties for all bargaining unit employees. That's a mistake because now the union gets to basically check whether that job can be changed or not. And so to have a committee that says it will review and modify, now modification should come from management, not from the union. Modification of job duties for all bargaining union employees. That's a mistake. I put that one example in just to illustrate that point. It's okay for them to make recommendations, but not to have the responsibility to modify. That's a management responsibility. Remember, decision-making authority rests with management. And one of the mistakes also to don't is the fact that we tend to, as managers sometimes are so busy, we go into meetings unprepared. And that's not a good thing as well because you're going to be taken advantage of if you don't know the issues. So you schedule the meetings, make sure you're prepared before you go into the meetings, know the issue, know the contract language, so you won't be at a disadvantage. And again, with, with respect to unions, don't mislead them. Tell them untruth. Don't you know you're going to hurt the relationship in terms of labor management relationships. Always try and be as truthful as you can, whether it's news that they want to hear or not, would be truthful. And the other point is, don't send unseasoned and experienced persons as your chief negotiator during the collective bargaining process. And that's very important. You know, just because a person can have, uh, you know, or they can walk and talk at the same time, they can be a negotiator. No, it's a seasoned process, and it takes time to understand and look and have vision about visions about what the future should look like. Because when you negotiate a labor contract, it's not that contract alone that's important. It's a contract coming uh, after that contract. You have to look at a contract and say, okay, 
look, uh, where do we want to be two or three contracts ahead of where we are today? What type of workforce do we want? What are the things, some of the things we want to make changes to in the future? Because if you don't, you lock yourself in and then you uh, basically buying back your management rights that you already had. So that's important. And then one of the things is the union would love to have the general manager at the chief, as a chief negotiator because most cases general managers want to be loved and they want to be, um, you know, and uh, have the union uh, like them because they don't want any union unrest. But it's not good for them to be the chief spokesperson because the union will try and take advantage of them. Because <clears throat> So it's important that the general manager is the person you check with, the person that you go to to consult with away from the bargaining table. I would discourage anyone from uh, encouraging their general manager to be at the bargaining table because uh, unions will try and pick their pockets. And I've seen that in not just the transit industry, but I've seen it in the U.S. Postal Service as well and um, in academia. Uh, so I would just say that uh, the general manager should be the person that you appeal to or talk to about what changes you want to make and also decision making as to the economic items that are on the table. But they should not be at the table itself. I think that's a mistake when they are there. Um, and don't sit on bargaining unit issues. Try to resolve them as early as lowest possible level, as many of you know, and expedite them as possible, as expeditiously as possible, because liability continues to grow. But you have a grievance that sits there for a year or two. Well, that liability, if an arbitrator rules on it, you, you're talking about a lot of back pay if he awards back pay or she awards back pay. So, or uh, if it's a liability related to safety issues or something that can be very um, costly. So you want to try to resolve issues as as, uh, at, as quickly as possible and get them out of the way if you can. And don't let the unions intimidate you with grievances. The question is, they can file the grievances, but can they win the grievance? So you shouldn't be intimidated by grievances. You like to intimidate a lot of times with saying they're going to file a grievance. You shouldn't be concerned about that as long as you know the contract and you're doing your job. Uh, every grievance, they obviously, they cannot win. And um, so you just do your job and, and continue to uh, follow the contract, and they won't prevail unless you know your agency is wrong in some respects. All right. And so we we'll move on to what things you might face. You have choices here as managers who have faced or have faced the choices in dealing with the unions at your agency. And these are some of the choices. You can fight with the union to try to achieve your goals, give in go around, or you can ignore the union leadership. Well, just recently, um, last few years, uh, a study was done, and I was part of that study, and we talked about what's the better choice. And one of the choices, one of the choices is partnership. You know, partnership scary is a scary term to some managers because it thinks that it's going to be something that they have to give away their rights. No, it's not. It's more like a labor management committee that doesn't have decision-making authority. So you can partner with the union, and a lot of times that is the better choice. And I'm going to share with you just a few things that came out of the study, partnership with the union, and try to achieve your goals. And we found that to be a lot of times a better method to go about uh, building a labor management relationship and having, you know, <coughs> um, issues resolved. And as I said earlier, this is my firm, along with two other firms, we were selected by TCRP uh, to conduct their study on labor management partnerships for the transit industries. It was a study that it's been in the works for a long period of time, but it's never been funded, and it was funded. Um, and um, I was part of that study, and it was a two-year study in where we interviewed and, sur and surveyed both management and union representatives at various size transit properties throughout the United States. It's published right now. The project report is published in TCRP Report 181. You can contact them if you want to get a copy. It's a two-volume, two-year two study, but it's a two-volume report. It's had a lot of great things in there and a lot of ideas that came out of the study uh, and might be instrumental if you're really interested in learning more about what the, uh, uh, the partnership relationship and what the unions had to say and the manager had to say about it. So I want to share with you just a few of the things that came out of it I think is very important. The research team, we asked uh, survey questions, survey respondents, what they thought of their transit agency, could, what they thought they could gain from improved labor management cooperation, and their responses provided the following benefits. Better customer service, fewer grievances, higher morale, cost savings, and more funding. Those were some of the major areas that they identified. Now, 
what did manage some of the barriers that management identified for us is that the following barriers were frequently raised by management respondents in the survey. Union leaders, they identify these. Union leaders do not honor mutual agreed decisions. That was a big one. They felt that, you know, you would agree, have an agreement with the union leadership and then they would ignore it and that created problems. So that was one of the things that they felt was a barrier to having any type of partnership with the union. The union's belief in an antagonistic culture. They felt that the unions were basically always antagonizing management uh, and basically not really wanting to cooperate. Complexity raising the uh, union elections from the union elections with uh, in, internal rivals and coalitions. And so they felt that union internal relationships within themselves, like uh, someone running against a union president, would keep that from happening because they would say that the current leadership is too close to management. And so they would not want to uh, cooperate with management because they didn't want to be seen as being cozy to management. And then the other was lack of resources to maintain adequate or existing wages and benefits. So those are some of the uh, barriers raised by management. The union raised the following barriers. They were saying that partnerships couldn't happen because low-level managers do not believe in or follow the contract or grievance process. And they cited management's fear of a good labor management relationship. They think that management is concerned that the union is going to be running the show if they have a partnership with them. And so that prohibited them from uh, wanting to have a labor management, a solid labor management partnership with the union, I mean, with management. And then management's uncertainty and insecurity regarding their future and lack of foresight. They felt that, you know, with that lack of funding, not being sure about funding, they didn't want to be too cozy to do uh, the union because they felt that um, some of the politicians would say they're the union is running the show. And so as a consequence, uh, they uh, felt that that was a barrier in terms of uh, having a good relationship or partnership with the union, with the management, rather. But the conclusion of the study was that labor management partnerships are an effective way to improve labor management relations in the transit industry. And the benefits are identified for you right there, effective operations, management decision-making, fair compensation, employee welfare, training and career development opportunities, safety and health, employees' morale and uh, productivity. And most, Im most importantly, the successful labor management partnerships can achieve such benefits without compromising the union's independence and management's prerogatives. That's important to note because it's been a fear about partnerships that it would compromise those areas, the union's independence and management prerogatives. Well, those that have those labor management partnerships, and there were some transit properties that have them, uh, they found that not to be the case. And they were very excited about the partnerships they had uh, and do have currently. And um, so it was a, um, I think, very beneficial study to find out that labor management partnerships can exist but it goes back to the relationship and it goes back to the three principles that we talked about earlier. Uh, and in terms of what the management would like to do with the union and, and the respect that each party has toward each other and the trust that he have for each other. So those are the partnership benefits uh, as to the choices you can have. So just remember this, uh, with respect to uh, labor management relations, there are some basic rights that you need to always keep in mind. There are two basic rights. Management principles that I call are just key. The management has a right to direct the workforce. And that's the right that you do have, and it should never be diminished. And that's why I said with respect to labor management partnerships or labor management committees, you keep the decision-making authority with management because you have the right to direct the workforce. But the union has the right the basic right to represent their bargaining unit members. So in terms of providing surveys out to the bargaining unit, you should have to go to the union and tell them you're going to survey their members because they are their representatives. And so I've seen a number of cases where managers put a lot of surveys out. They didn't go through the union leadership and it led to a lot of grievances. So it's important to know your rights under the collective bargaining agreement and the right to direct the workforce and know the union's right. And the union's basic right is not to direct the workforce, it's only to represent. And so if you keep those two things in mind and the principles of, of a good labor management relationship and the choices you can have with respect to that, 
I think you'll do fine. And um, so I've, there's a lot of other issues that could be addressed but those are the basics in terms of having a good labor management relationship from my years of experience and from the various uh, places I have represented and the um, issues I've run across. So if you have any questions, um, you're going to be entertained now. And uh, if you need any assistance, uh, my number's there. I'm always willing to. We're a management consulting firm, so, you know, if you need any assistance, we're there for you as well. Thank you. I appreciate it, Bill. Thank you. That was very good. I got some good stuff. A little bit of a national picture as well. Um, so the question uh, box is open, so if you have any uh, questions please or comments, please type them in and we'll uh, relay them. While that's happening, I think I have one question that comes up pretty much uh, consistently in all of Eno's classes. I want to see if you can give us some examples of, of how first-level supervisors, uh, maybe mid-managers, uh, can be coached to better support that union management relationship. Uh, you mentioned in a couple of places there about how first level uh, supervisors are a potential uh, landmine for a trusting relationship. Uh, how can you bring those folks on board with the agency mission? Yeah, your your um, your audio is kind of breaking up a little bit. I don't know if you. Uh uh, moving around a lot, but uh, if I understand you correctly, how do we bring the labor? How do we bring supervisors on board? Yes, uh, yes. In terms perfect. of training, you mean? Well, how can you? Yes, you have to be training them. But how else? What other management techniques or uh, in, uh, other methods could be used to get them to follow the mission of management and also work well with their unionized employees? Right. Yeah. Well, I think it's very important. The, the key is orientation when they um, you're thinking about contemplating moving someone up uh, to a supervisory. Most supervisors are coming from the bargaining unit. A lot. Uh, some are hired off the street, but most are coming from the bargaining unit, and they already have a mindset with like a union member. And so, as a consequence of that, they just should not be, in my view, moved directly into management without having uh, some contract training on management rights because many of them don't know management rights and what they're to do. They know how to tell someone to do a particular job, break down an engine or uh, put a bus, you know, uh, operate a, a vehicle. But in terms of being able to know the contract from a management perspective, they need to have some training. And uh, one, of the things that, one of the things that we fall down on is that we cut our training budgets Always, that's one of the first things to go. So we don't end up, you know, training the people properly. And so they're put out there on the street, really, and it's in a disservice to them because they're put out there as supervisors without having that proper training. And it's an orientation process that because to be a manager, a good manager in a bargaining unit environment, you have to know that contract because that is the relationship that you have with the bargaining unit. So, you know, if you don't know what uh, what the rules are with respect to absenteeism, and if you don't know what the rules are with respect to, you know, um, safety issues related to, uh, you know, uh, availability of work and when people are scheduled to report and not scheduled to report and what the uh, overtime rules are and things like that, um, you're going to make a lot of mistakes and then they're going to be frustrated. So it's an orientation process that I think uh, is missing from newly supervised, newly promoted supervisors. And those that are there we tend to, and I've, you know, I've been involved for a little while, and so we tend to uh, know our jobs, but we don't know the contract. And so we know our jobs and the contract. Those two things have to be compatible because it's not just knowing the job. If you're in a non-unionized environment, it doesn't make a difference because, you know, you know your job and that's it. But the jobs in most cases are layered with the labor contract. So it's not just the fact of putting the service out on the street. You have to know how you put it out there in a, in a labor context. And so that requires knowing the labor contract itself because most of these, a lot of times the supervisors become frustrated because they get a lot of grievances. And, you know, it's kind of unfair to them because they're getting these grievances. And uh, in many cases, they just don't know what rights they have and how to administer uh, the labor contract in the context of their job. No, thank you. Um, so I haven't seen no other questions. I think uh, we can probably end the webinar here. I want to thank you, Bill, for taking the time to uh, give
give us this overview of, of good labor relations. Uh, thank everybody for attending. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. This will get posted out on the Eno alumni page, um, and the people to forward this over to colleagues uh, that would like to view it. Uh, just we will have uh, more of these webinars on people development and organizational development uh, sprinkled throughout the year. Uh, some of you might be aware Eno does quite a few policy ones, but we will be adding uh, these organizational development uh, webinars to the, uh, the roster as well. Uh, the next alumni activity we have, uh, September 12th, our virtual reading roundtable, our book club. Uh, we'll be on the lookout for uh, emails about that. And uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.